The Bible knows nothing about a creation in Christ that is not part of a gathering body. I'm going to look at the duties and privileges that the New Testament says to us about those who are in the body, and it's a massive amount. We can't possibly get our arms around that in any two settings, at least not without putting some sort of categories to it. So I'm going to use the categories of duties and privileges in the body of Christ to God, duties and privileges to the world, and duties and privileges to one another. I'm not the inventor of this. I didn't create this. I'm following the lead of many other people, and I think it's a natural, a logical kind of a way to categorize some of the duties and privileges that are ours in the body of Christ. Privileges and duties to God, to one another, and to the world. Now, we're going to see a great deal of overlap in all these. Our duties to one another are also, in a real sense, duties to God. Our duties to the world, in a real sense, are also duties to God, and vice versa. So we see a great deal of overlap in them. But as best we can, we're just going to kind of categorize these, and we won't be exhaustive by any means, but hopefully we will be representative in our selectiveness. So when we look at our duties unto God, and we look to the Scriptures, I think that there is one duty that the Scripture holds out to us that is our primary, the premium, the foundational duty, privilege that we have as the body of Christ unto God, and that is the duty and the privilege of being present at the gatherings of the body in a proper state of preparedness. There are many other duties that the body of Christ has unto God, but I see as primary, as foundational to be present at the gatherings of the body in a proper state of preparedness. So, it's at this point we might say, well, there's this phrase that sort of coincides with this, and it goes like this. You're preaching to the choir. You ever heard that? You're preaching to the choir. That means that the people that are hearing what you're saying aren't the people that need to hear that. Which is to say that you are, for the most part, those people of God who, unless providentially prevented, are here under the preaching of the Word of God. So that phrase might apply. But let me just add a word of caution. Just because you are not entangled in a particular sin does not mean that you cannot spiritually benefit from God's rebuke of that sin. That's a mistake that we sometimes make. When we hear God's rebuke of a sin that does not involve us, that we're not enslaved to, we sort of have this switch that we like to turn off to say, well, that's not, he's not talking to me. Just because you are not enslaved to a particular sin does not mean that God's rebuke of that sin is not spiritually beneficial to you. Think of John the baptizer. The Pharisees are coming to him and he says, who told you to flee the coming wrath, you brood of vipers? Well, it's clear from John's interaction with them that they were coming to hear John's words and receive John's words. So he's rebuking them for a sin that they've left. Nevertheless, he still rebukes them. He still issues this rebuke, and they spiritually benefit from that. Likewise, Jesus will do the same thing. He will, he will say to his disciples, about, he will warn them about the yeast of the Pharisees' false teachings. They're not engaged in false teaching, the disciples. Yet, there's been spiritual benefit for them through hearing the rebuke that's given to a sin that they're not enslaved to. There's that to say, likewise, also, if there is a rebuke, then I would say receive that this morning from the Lord. But if you are one of those who, unless providentially prevented, you're here to hear the, the, the hearing of the Word of God, if you're part of the body of Disciples Fellowship, and you are one who is present in a prepared state for the for the bringing of the Word of God, for the gathering of God's people, then I would just say, hear this for what it is, which is a rebuke from God, an instruction from God that is not necessarily a sin that you're entangled with, but it is a clear warning that we should steer clear of this. So let's proceed forward. Again, the church's most fundamental privilege and duty, privilege and duty, is to be present at the gatherings of the body and in a proper state of preparedness. When we talk about this fundamental duty and privilege that is to the body of Christ to be present for the gatherings and to be prepared for such things. We might want to recollect a few Sundays back when we were talking about the same thing, and I made mention of the fact that there's only one place in the New Testament that the New Testament speaks directly to this. And so that's an indication for us that the early church, the New Testament church, wasn't a church that struggled with chronic absenteeism. 
because it's not a topic that's addressed with regularity in the New Testament. In fact, only one time is it addressed. And so we might say, well, there's this paucity of amount of material that's devoted to this act, to this issue of those who are part of the body of Christ but are absent from the gatherings. There's not very much that the New Testament has to say about that. However, let's pause for just a minute and let's rethink this. I'm going to suggest that there is a mountain that the New Testament has to say about this, even though it doesn't address it specifically except in one occasion. And here's what I mean. The New Testament church, the early church, didn't seem to struggle with people that were part of the body that were chronically absent. And the reason we know that is because the New Testament writers, by and large, just seem to assume that when they wrote a letter to the church, everybody in the church would be there when it was read. There is just this pervasive assumption throughout the letters of the New Testament that when Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he's rebuking among the Corinthian church, uh, Christians, the ones who are suing each other in court and the ones who are tolerating the sexual deviant and the ones who are tolerating the false teaching and the ones who are abusing the supper. He just assumes that his rebuke will be heard when the letter's read. There's never a sense that any of the rebukes in any of the letters to the New Testament church ever includes something like, oh, make sure you get a word to so-and-so. We know you haven't seen so-and-so in a while, so make sure you get word to... There's none of that except in the one instance where the letter to the Hebrews addresses it directly. There is just this overwhelming sense that the New Testament writers just made that assumption. And sure, there were providential situations. Maybe somebody was injured at work, maybe somebody was a slave, and on that particular day their master wouldn't let them go to the gathering. Sure, those things took place, but there's just this overwhelming assumption that the New Testament writers never had to address this, that when they addressed someone in the church, that someone would be there when the letter was read. It never seems to occur to Paul that when he rebukes Yodia and Syntyche, that they weren't there to hear it. Jesus says his words to the seven churches. And he says, you know, get the Jezebel out. It, it just seems to be assumed that even though they were false teachers, even though that they were completely sideways with the doctrine of the church, they were still there. Even in the letter to the Corinthians, the letter to the Corinthians, the most worldly, the most unhealthy church in the entirety of the New Testament, we find that not only did they not have a problem with members not coming. It was just the opposite. That in the Corinthian church, they were coming under the wrong reasons, under the wrong motivations. They had the wrong reasoning. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But they would talk about how they abused the supper because they were treating the supper wrongly and they were coming to the supper, but just with the wrong attitudes and the wrong agendas. So we just have this pervasive assumption that when a letter was written to a church and the letter was read in the church, that everyone in the church would have been there to hear it. So that's compelling. But what I think is even more compelling than that would be when we look to the word pictures that the New Testament uses to describe the church. Jesus and the writers of the New Testament will oftentimes use these metaphors or these, these word pictures to describe to us the church. And there would be different word pictures to describe some different aspect or some different facet of the church. And we're familiar with those. The church is the bride. The church is the body. The church is the household of God. The church is a spiritual house. The church is a temple. The church is the sanctuary of God. The church is a family. And we could go on. But if we think for just a moment about each one of those metaphors, each one of those word pictures, I would challenge you to find one single word picture in the New Testament describing the church that doesn't completely fall apart when you take that word picture out of the context of the gathered body. None of them hold together. Every metaphor for the church, every word picture for the church only makes sense in the context of the gathered body. And if you take that word picture out 
of the context of the gathered body, they fall apart just like a sweater that you pull the loose strand on and the whole thing comes apart. That's what happens to all of those word pictures of the church when you take that idea outside of the gathered body. We are being built into a spiritual house. What sense does a house make when it's missing this block over here and that block over there and that piece of wood over there? A family a holy priesthood, a holy nation, any of those metaphors, a body. Do you know that there's something rather disquieting, unsettling about seeing a person missing an appendage? You know what I'm talking about? When you see somebody that's missing an appendage, a leg or an arm or something like that, an ear, isn't it something unsettling about that? Something sort of offsetting? It's supposed to be. Because bodies are supposed to be whole. That's the whole point of the metaphor. Bodies are supposed to be whole. And when you see a body that's not whole, your brain automatically says something's wrong about that. On the counterpart to that, when you see a body that has something that's attached to it that's not part of it, you call that a growth. And that's also rather disquieting, but that's a whole different subject altogether. We're not talking about that right now. We're talking about a part of the body that's missing. And we see that and we say, that's just not right. There's something wrong there. The body is supposed to be a complete whole body. And so all of these pictures of the church just absolutely fall apart if they're taken to mean the individual Lone Ranger Ranger Christian. Any Christian who claims to know God to know Jesus Christ, to know the Father through the Son, who claims to be a redeemed child of God and not part of a gathering body, you are a creature that the Bible knows nothing about. The Bible knows nothing about a creation in Christ that is not part of a gathering body. That's the only framework through which the New Testament understands Followers of Christ in this world. And all the metaphors hold that out. You know what the Shema is? You ever heard of the Shema? Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. It is the most holy scripture to the Jew. It's it's kind of like their counterpart of the Lord's Prayer for us. You know how we repeat the Lord's Prayer, that sort of thing. The Shema is that for the Jew. And it's easy to remember. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The, The Jew will repeat that many times a day. And it is the most holy and the most sacred and the most most formative scripture for the Jew. And that idea of a God that's undividable, unseparatable, it permeates not only the Old Testament teachings, but it permeates the New Testament teachings, all of which come to us from those who are steeped in Old Covenant theology. Those who are steeped in the idea that God is inseparable. He's not dividable. You can't have part of God over here. You can't slice a piece of God up over there. You can't have some of God here and not over there. And so the very understanding of God Himself requires this unity, this non-division, this togetherness that flows through to all the New Testament metaphors. So we see that I find that compelling in the New Testament pictures. But just let's just look quickly to the old biblical evidence where it points to it directly. From Hebrews chapter 9, it comes to us in verse 25. So let's look at this. If we had more time, there's a whole sermon here and more because this has much to say to us, but we know the point that it's building up to. In verse 25, there's the statement, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. But let's begin back in verse 19 and kind of build up to this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. 
Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing nearer. So there we see the not neglecting to come together, to meet together, as some would have. That, that, that word neglecting oftentimes is, is translated deserting or forsaking. You think about the disciples forsaking or deserting Jesus. Same word here, forsake, desert, neglect. Do not forsake, do not neglect, do not desert the gathering together. But let's, let's also look, because this says much more to us than just make sure you gather together. This tells us make sure you gather together like this. In other words, you could physically be present and still be neglecting the gathering together if you came together in such a way that you lost your confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. We are to come together, not just meeting in the same room, but together with the confidence that the blood of Jesus has removed our sins. We come together with that confidence by this new and living way He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh. We have no doubt, no second thoughts, that His flesh, His sacrifice of His body, opened the curtain for us. We come together knowing that since we have this great high priest over the house of God, we draw near with this true heart and full assurance of faith. We forsake His assembling if we come together without assurance of faith, without confidence of faith, without knowing that He is our great high priest. Yes, He is like us. He is our elder brother, but He is our great high priest. He is the captain of our salvation. And we come together knowing that. We come together sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. So we come together without having unrepented sin, unconfessed sin. We come together without holding this knowing sin in our life, knowing that this is sinful in God's presence, and yet we like it, and so we don't want to leave it. We don't come together like that. We come together free from an evil conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. We don't come together second-guessing our confession. We don't come together second-guessing our hope, not being confident in the object of our hope. We come together knowing that He who promised is faithful. We know that He's faithful. We don't come together wondering if God is faithful or not. We come together considering how to stir one another up to love and to good works. How would we stir one another up to love and good works if we didn't come together? How do you stir one another up to those things when you're apart? You can only do that by coming together. So we come together with a view towards stirring one another up to love and and to good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of son, but encouraging one another. So is that how we come together? Is that how you come into this place? Do others in the body say, my faith is strengthened by so-and-so brother. My, my, my love is encouraged by such-and-such sister. I am provoked to do good works because of so-and-so in the body. That is how we are to come together. <laughs> 